to a new community as an older person, and typically can find a difficult adjustment. When my father, Yechiel Wenger, decided to live two blocks away from me, I was anxious about how this would go. However, I was pleasantly surprised at how well he adjusted to Highland Park. In particular, he found a warm and welcoming community in Congregation Ohebenet. He would be invited to lunch, find inspirational shirim and enthusiastic learning partners, and it was common that I would meet people that would say, oh, I know your father. In particular, one thing, Joe and Kaya Friedman invited him over quite often, and they even threw him more than one birthday finish. <laughs> it was also his good fortune that the polo moved to town around, around the same time he did, and there he established learning partners and friends. When in his last year, he was in the hospital or at the Regency, it was gratifying to know how many people visited him. I thank everyone who gave him a ride or even a warm greeting. You are all greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Brittany, for those beautiful words. And um, I think, like you said, it was really a great shit of uh, between uh, Hill Wenger and Congregation of Bennett and Highland Park and the Highland Park Hola. It really worked out well. Uh, my father-in-law was fond of reading books of Musar, books of uh, ethics and proper behavior. And uh, one of his favorite books was written by Rabbi Chaim Shmulavitz who was the Rosh Yeshiva of the Nir Yeshiva uh, before World War II, and then he escaped to Shanghai, and he reestablished the Yeshiva in Yerushalayim after the war. And he would write the, uh, the book was written based on the Parshio, and uh, one of my father's most favorite Parshio was on Noah, and he gave a Devar Torah during one of the uh, Shon Zafars of our children, and um, we studied it together afterwards. So I'd like to just briefly go over that uh, talk by Rabbi Shmuelovitz, Lezeichah Mishman, Michal Yitzvach, Ben Shmuel. So at the end of uh, Parsha Bereshit, it says that Noah was 500 years old, and he gave birth to Shem, Ham, and Yafet. And people during Noah's time tended to live a very long life, you know, 800, 900 years old but they tended to have children around 100 years old. So Noah really stands out as being old when he has children. He was 500 years old. And Rashi uh, quotes the Medrash to address this issue. Uh, Rav Yudin said, why did all the people of that generation have children at around 100? And Noah was 500 years old when he first gave birth to children. So Seneca Baruch Hu, if these children are Rishayim, then Noah will be greatly pained because they will be destroyed in the model. And if they are Tzadikim, I will trouble Noah because he'll have to build all these boats to save all of his descendants. So what Hashem did is he prevented Noah from having children until he was 500 years old, and then his oldest child did not reach age 100 until the flood, and that was the uh, age of judgment at that time. So Rav Shmuel Lovitz asks on this Medrash, if Noah's sons were worthy, would it really have been such a burden for him to build some extra boats? And he had hundreds of years on his hands. And given the choice, is it not likely that Noah would have preferred the blessing of having children, along with the burden of having to build many boats, rather than being barren for 500 years? His sons could have helped Noah build the boats, or maybe he could have hired some carpenters to uh, assist in the task. So in order to answer this question, Rav Shemulavitz introduces a concept of how Masira Nefesh, 100% devotion and love for a task, can fuse a special spiritual power in an object, even in an inanimate object. He gives several examples of this phenomenon. The Gemara and Yuma describes how Nicanor went to Alexandria to bring back two doors for the gates of the Behamidash. On the way back, there was a storm, 
at sea and it looked like the boat would sink in order to save the boat. The sailors threw one of the heavy doors into the sea. But the weather was still stormy. So Nicanor hugged this door and said, if you're going to throw this second door into the boat, which is what the sailors want you to do, then throw me in as well. And after he said that, the seas became calm. But all the way back to the port, Nicanor was mourning about the first door that was thrown into the sea. But when they arrived in the port in Akko, it turned out that the first door they had thrown into the sea was actually floating along with the boat. So they were able to use it to build the Benoni Dash. And Rav Shmulovs explains that the love and devotion that Nicanor had infused that door with a special spiritual power. So it was able to float on the, on the water and stay connected and arrive at the port. Another example that Rav Shmulov cites is from the book of Shmuel. In the beginning of that sefer, it says that Hana made Shmuel a small coat. Chazal explained that Shmuel wore the same coat throughout his life. All the tears and all the prayers and all the love that Hana had, she invested in that coat. That devotion of Hana penetrated the coat. It absorbed the coat so that the coat had the spiritual power to grow along with Shmuel as he grew. So with this concept established from pouring spiritual power to an object to Monsieur Nefesh, Rav Shmuel Lovitz now returns to answer the question of why it was necessary for Noah to build all the, the, the Teba himself and no one else could do this. The ark was not an ordinary boat. It was a vehicle of salvation and redemption. The Ramban explains that the ark could not possibly have housed all of the different species of animals in existence. The large animals, such as elephants and hippopotamus, all of the different species of insects and birds. The ark had a special spiritual power that enabled it to absorb all of the different animals in the world and save them from the raging flood waters. What gave the ark the spiritual power was Noah's Mesira Nefesh in building the ark. While the Torah does not record that Noah spoke to the people of his generation, and some commentators criticize Noah for being so silent, his building of the ark was his way of communicating the upca upcoming disaster. Building a large boat on dry land for 120 years must have attracted a lot of attention. Noah must have told the people why he was building the ark. The people of his generation may have mocked Noah or physically threatened him, but he kept at his task. This was not a job that could be outsourced to another carpenter, even to his relatives. The building of the ark had to be carried out by Noah himself, the man who found favor in Hashem's eyes, and it had to be built for 120 years. This is what gave the ark its special spiritual powers. Rav Shmuel Lewis goes on to explain that if applying love and devotion to an inanimate object can have such an impact, imagine what applying the Seward Nefesh could have to another living human being. And he gives the example of Moshe Rabbeinu. Chazal say that Moshe had ten different names. Each name described a different aspect of Moshe's attributes. For example, one name was Yerim, from the word Horib because Moshe brought the Torah down from the heavens to the earth. Another name of Moshe was heaven, from the word Lechaber, because he joined the name Israel to their father in heaven. Despite having all these names, Hashem told Moshe, I will only call you by the name that Bacha Bacha called you, Moshe. The name Moshe symbolizes the ultimate act of humility, kindness, and devotion. Bacha went against her father's decree, she saved Moshe's life and raised him in kindness. This act of planted in Moshe the power and ability to the savior and redeemer of Israel. Moshe left the comforts of the palace and went out to see how his brothers were doing. He intervened in other people's quarrels, endangering his personal safety and security. And he constantly defended the Israel before God after they had sinned. These qualities ruined Moshe from the seeds that Baja had planted in him at a young age. 
I think this message is very relevant to this evening. The field was very caring and concerned about other people. He lived in Highland Park just a few years and had a big impact on the community. And to echo what Leora had just said, it is a tribute to the shul and community. An older person can move here from another place and be made to feel so welcome and at home in such a short period of time. We are very, very grateful to Congregation Oak Emmet and the Highland Park Colel and all of our family members of the community who welcomed him and made him a part of the Highland Park family. Thank you. <laughs> you also know that we're behind schedule. <laughs> so what we're going to do is open up the buffets now, okay, and have your meals, enjoy them, and we'll come back to the regular program that we had scheduled after we all have an opportunity. Yeah, right. <laughs> However, I would like to say that you will still have an opportunity uh, while the buffet is open to put tickets in the uh, Chinese auction and to buy more tickets, which we encourage you to do so. And so, thank you. And uh, just give the people who are selling the tickets a few minutes to eat, and then you know, I'll be happy to sell you more tickets. That's it. That's it. <laughs>